Welcome, everybody. This is Two Ed Tech Guys Take Questions and Share Cool Stuff, uh, which we like to do. And if you're wondering what the show is all about, you weren't listening to the name of the show. Um, and we get together and we, we talk about all kinds of cool things that are out there. I do things like remember to turn on the captions even before I turn this slide over, which uh, happens from time to time. But, but mostly it's just a thanks. Thanks to you for, for watching this, either because you are live, part of a live studio audience, no actual studio, um, or you are watching this as a recording or you sharing it with somebody or you lost a bet and have to watch it. Whatever it is, we're glad you're here. Uh, a little bit about us, starting with Richard. Tell us about Free Tech for Teachers. Free Tech for Teachers, which just passed its 16,000th blog post. I can't even say 16,000, but 16,000 blog posts have now been published there. And almost all of them have been written by me. 99% of them have been written by me over the last 14 years of cool, interesting things you can use in your classroom for free. That's wonderful, and, and I quite like that uh, that the the transcription in Google Slides uh, got sixteen thousandth as sixty thousand live births. <laughs> so my little shindig is Next Vista for Learning. It's an online library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a student audience, all screen content. My own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance, one creative video at a time. Uh, and so you'll find in our library videos about academic topics and communities around the world and service to others and plenty more as well. Videos for those learning English and those exploring careers and, and all sorts of this and that. And so if you're curious about that, by all means, let me know and I'll be happy to tell you more about it. Today is October 7th as we record. And so you know, today is the day. This is the big shout out. We didn't even know we were going to have an Albertan in, in, in the house. And here we are. Alison Redford, 10 years ago, was sworn in as premier of Alberta. Okay, so she was the first female premier. But at that time, I believe uh, she was like the fourth female premier uh, in, in Canada at that time, which set a record, which is kind of cool. All right. And back in 1950, Mother Teresa established the Missionaries of Charity. So, you know, any, anybody who's trying to get a, a good sense of what it takes to live a really righteous life, Mother Teresa. And then in 1916, Georgia Tech defeated Cumberland 222 to zero, the most lopsided game in the history of American college football. You look at this and you think, wow, that's the, the Georgia Tech coach must have been quite the, uh, you, know, you know, quite the bully. Actually, if you read about this, you will find that there's all kinds of interesting elements uh, to, to this game. So, for example, um, the Cumberland football program had been, uh, had been disbanded the year before. And, and apparently uh, the, the Georgia Tech people were like, hey, look, you know, you, you've, you've got to play this game because you contracted to play the game with us. And, you know, according to the contract, you got to pay us three thousand dollars if, uh, if you're not going to show up and pay this play this game. And apparently the coach actually then incentivized it by saying, I'll give you five hundred dollars just to show up. So apparently uh, a group of fraternity brothers showed up as the Cumberland football team got roundly demolished. And why two hundred and twenty two to zero? Well, earlier in the season, earlier in the year, uh, the baseball team, the Cumberland baseball team had walloped Georgia Tech 22 to zero. And so there's some theory that, uh, that this was all payback mm -hmm. along those lines, but it's, it's just hard to know. Anyway, you're all better for knowing that, I am sure. So how does this work here? We're going we're gonna to answer some questions and then we're going to show you some cool stuff. Then we're going to answer some more questions and then we're going to finish up. And if you want to stick around and talk to us a bit, you're certainly welcome to do so. So jumping into the questions, Richard, start us off. What's our first question today? All right, let's start with this one from Sarah, who said, my colleague told me about some cool add-ons she's using with her students. I was wondering if you have any favorite Google Slide add-ons for high school students. Well, that's kind of a broad topic, kind of a broad, uh, broad question, I should say. What, but, you know, one of my go-tos for anytime I'm asked this sort of question is to recommend a tool that will make it easier for students to properly cite images that they find in their presentations. To that end, I like the Unsplash Photos uh, Google Slides add-on because it will make sure that they're using images they have the rights to use and they have a little hyperlink right to the source. That's one that I really like. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of a, an add-on called Slido, which is a polling tool you can use inside Google Slides. Uh, another one that I think is really important, and I mentioned it on one of our episodes sometime last year, Rushton, Grackle Slides. Uh, Grackle is an add-on that will evaluate your slides. It also works with docs, uh, but evaluate your slides for accessibility. Make sure it meets accessibility standards for screen readers. So if you are using, making, you know, if you're making slides and you're gonna share them online, uh, Grackle is a, it's a good, good tool to have uh, as well. So. All right. Well, Richard, if you wanna get those links in the chat, uh, that'll, that'll be useful for the folks that we've got here uh, participating in, in, today's, in today's little shindig. Um, I'm going to add to that, that, that while uh, I, I've actually, o over time, shifted away from almost any add-ons, um, you know, something like Unsplash, you know, totally reputable company, good, good stuff there, all good. Um, and, and the other two that Richard mentioned, I'm sure are fine as well. But uh, I, I, I just have gotten to where I worry about almost anything that I add to, uh, to, to my uh, Google account, whether it's an extension or a slide or an add-on of, of some sort, really just kind of out of, out of that concern of like, you know, I mean, it's become such a, a business to, uh, to use these kinds of tools, to jump onto all kinds of information. I, you know, just, I just, I'm just hesitant. So, so, you too. You know, make sure you know the company. You've done you've done some research on on the uh, the add-on. You got a good feel for what it is they're doing, what their business model is, things like that. Yeah. Cool. Keep us going, Richard. All right. Sorry, I put the wrong link in the uh, I put the wrong links in there in the in the chat. So I'll try to get those corrected for the uh, for the copy that goes out to everybody. But uh, I'll, get those, I'll get those sorted out. Uh, this one came from Judith, friend of the program from just a little bit north of me. I was actually more west of me than north of me, but that's, anyway, Judith asked, I was wondering if you have any good ideas for using the grading in Google Classroom. It appears when you use points in topics, all is good. However, when you try the weighting, not so good. We've mostly been suggesting teachers use the points and then import them into a sheet where the magic can happen. Also prevents us from losing the grade if we delete the topic or assignment. Uh, so, Russian, you have a resource link already queued up for this one. Actually. I do, I do. So, so what what this is? Um, I when I first got this question uh, in an email from from Judith, I thought, all right, I mean, that's just that's just classroom and and grades. It's just not that great, really. I mean, just I don't. But but later, I did some searching on it, and I'll show you what I found. It was this. So apparently you can do weighted grading in, in classroom or at least support.google.com suggests you can. And so on the assumption that, that uh, this is all accurate and they've worked out some bugs, then, uh, then yes, you, you, can, you can do weighted grading. Now I'd be curious to know, Judith is actually in, in the audience, we'll call it. Um, if, if you have already taken a look at this, let us know and, and what you think of it. If not, no worries. Uh, Richard, anything to add to, to grading in Google Classroom? Um, I will say this, that unless, and this is coming from my own practical experience over the last couple of years, unless I am in a Google workspace or G Suite for Education domain that has importing into our SIS, our student information system, I don't mess around with the grade book in Google Classroom at all, other than, yep, they turned it in. Nope, they didn't turn it in. Uh, because otherwise I've got, I've already got to manually put it into the SIS that we're using anyway. So I just let whatever student information system, whatever grade book system that we're compelled to use, I just do it all there. And I don't worry about the Google Classroom grade book because it doesn't, you know, unless, Unless, again, unless you're in a school that has the um, infinite campus um, import option. And most schools don't have that set up right now that, I, that, I, that I've been around. Uh, I, I should say, I shouldn't say most. In my experience, most that I've been around don't have that set up. That said, 
more and more are doing it. Um, yeah. Good deal. Let's sure get a third question in before we get to the cool shares there. So, so a third question. One more question. Uh, all right. Uh, quick one. Uh, came from Zara. Would you please name a video recording tool that does not require an annual subscription? I'm a student and to create a video for my assignment. I don't know what the assignment is exactly, but the first one that came to mind for me was Screencastify. They have a free video editor. It's actually pretty good because you can do some cool stuff with it. The downside is you only have five minutes of video uh, that you can export or your, your, your project has to be five minutes or less, I should say, in the free version of it. Uh, but I'll add in that a five minute video, if done well, can be really powerful. A five minute video that's not done well can be really, really long, feel like it's 25 minutes long. That's the, a, fi a bad five minute video is a long, long video. Yeah. And, then, and I always tell people, I'd rather see a couple of two or three minute videos than one five minute video in most cases anyway. Every single time, absolutely. I, I would add to that that uh, Adobe Spark mm. is, uh, is something for which you need no, uh, no annual subscription or at least, uh, you know, actually I, I, I don't know if it, it might be different from in terms of where you are, but um, Spark, I have found, does a real good job of helping you helping you stay focused on nice, short, impactful videos, and they look pretty good as well. And you can the the uh, watermark with Spark is is limited, not uh, not the kind of thing that overpowers uh, the the visual. So all good there. And Nicole threw in into the chat there Flipgrid. Absolutely good, yeah, Flipgrid, good suggestion. Flipgrid for shorts feature, yeah, that'll be great. Yeah. And if we say that that's a really cool share from Nicole, ah, time for our cool share. So, so ah. Richard, tell, tell us about front pages. Today's, so front today, pages. today's front pages. I learned about this from Larry Fralazzo. Great blog for everyone to, to follow. If you think 16,000 blog posts is a lot, you should see Larry's blog. Uh, but today's front pages from the Freedom Forum it's a cool place to see the front pages of newspapers from all around the world. And you can uh, view it as a grid. You can view them as a list. But I think the neatest way to look at it is as a map. And you can look at it as an interactive map and click on one of the dots on the interactive map. So anywhere in the world, they've got newspapers from every continent except for Antarctica. Uh, and you can just click on them. You can look at that day's front page from the news, that area's newspaper, and you can click out to look at it on the newspaper's actual website as well. So I think it's great because I could say to my, let's say my, my social studies students, my current event students, hey, this is a trending news story. I want all of you to find how it's reported in a different country, right? And just, you know, everybody go, go pick a country and see how the story is reported in that country. Or, you know, pick a state or pick a province and how is that story reported in that state? So, nice way to do comparison, comparisons of, uh, of current events. Really nice. I went, when you when you put this one in as uh, as the share, I went and checked out uh, some some of the Arkansas uh, pa pages that were there, and and so the Arkansas Democrat. I went to high school in Arkansas. Thank you very much. You can tell in my accent, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, and and on the front page of today's paper at for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, uh, th there's a guy that I went to high school with, um, and, and yeah, he, he's he's actually in Arkansas government, and he was thundering about something and. More power to him. So shout out to Tim for uh, for, for doing what he cool. does there. Yeah, good fun. On the spookier side of shares, uh, it being October and all, I decided that we would get a, a ghost story that, that is an educator ghost story. And so what this is, is this is from, uh, from a podcast called Spooked. Uh, and what they do is they have scary stuff, I guess. You know, people like scary stories, right? And this is actually from right here in the Bay Area. So a, uh, a teacher in, in Los Gatos 
which is pretty cool. Uh, and so listen to it. Kind of got got the heebie-jeebies about it as well, which was, was kind of fun. Uh, and and I would I would recommend it as as kind of a cool thing to uh, to listen to. And then of course there is the very cool NV Ivy. What's that? Thank you for asking. That is the Next Vista inspiring video. Uh, every week we're putting out a wildly cool video with a set of discussion or writing prompts so that you can, it's just like a ready-made lesson to go. And we've had teachers in different parts of the world use this and say, man, this is great. Thank you for putting these out, which always good to get a thank you. This particular story this week, uh, I, I call it, I call the post, It Just Arrives. It's, it's something Peggy says, but this video is about a woman named Peggy who's uh, I think 80 years old. And she knits little sweaters for, uh, for babies uh, that she's never met. And she just goes to places in, in, uh, in her city where there are, are people, you know, kind of shopping at, at, you know, kind of bargain price shopping. And she'll see a mother with a child and she'll, she'll, she'll just say, you know, please take this for your child and, and talk to them. And it's, it's cool. It's just this really, really cool story. And she, she's a quirky lady, right? Uh, and, and this will be a story you don't soon forget. So I'll get that, uh, I'll get that in the chat uh, as we go. More questions. Richard, make it happen. More questions. So we have some more good ones. Uh, this one comes from Esty, who says, I teach in a high school in Holland, Israel, and, I, and we would like to connect with other students from the United States. How do I do it? Well, uh, I've got a couple of ideas. My first one was Flipgrid's Grid Pals function. If you're a Flipgrid user, if you're a, flip, a teacher using Flipgrid, there is a section you can turn, in, turn on in your teacher profile called Grid Pals, and you can see a map of other teachers who are using Flipgrid and are looking to connect their classroom with another. That's pretty neat. Uh, so that, that was one. Uh, EduBlogs also has a directory of class blogs. Uh, it hasn't been updated for a couple of years now. It hasn't been updated since the end of 2019. Hmm. So it might be a little bit out of date, but you can check it out. There is a directory of class blogs for people who want to, again, connect their classroom with another to do some, some blogging back and forth. And Russian, you, you put in a, a resource that I was not familiar with. So what's ah, that about? The, 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 the reason is because it is not a free one. All right. Hmm. And, and, and you, oh, master of, of all that is free. Uh, might might have skipped this one, seeing that it, it costs. But but I earned the International Educational Action and Resource Network. I think is what it is. Uh, has been around a long time, uh, well over well over a decade, and they've been connecting uh, classrooms around the world. They have these projects that you can get involved in, uh, and and so I earn .org is is a good crowd. I've, I've uh, hung out with them, you know, at, at, at conferences from time to time and just found, found them kind of cool and inspiring. I would say this for anyone thinking about doing a uh, class to class international collaboration project. There's loads of advice I could inflict on you, but the one big one is that try to have two adults on each side of the environment, of, of the arrangement, right? Because because life just happens. And sometimes, you know, somebody like there, something will happen in their family and they get kind of pulled away. And, you know, the other class is like, what happened? You know, we, we, we haven't heard from these people. Did we insult somebody? What happened? And so have a second adult who can be like, no, actually the person, we're going to have to put things, you know, on hold for a few weeks or whatever. That's just a really good move. Uh, so if, if you've got, you know, at least two people on either side who are exchanging ideas and, and, can, uh, and can just kind of keep in touch with each other, that, that can be a real good move. Cool. Keep us going, Richard. All right. Next one came from, oh, sorry. This one came from Beth, who asked, I looked through your list of suggestions for public domain pictures. I've tried Pixabay before, but I'm hesitant to try it out in my classroom because of some pictures I found. Is there a way to filter the images? So, uh, yes, the, the short answer is yes, you can do some filtering in Pixabay. 
However, it's done on an account by account basis. So your students would have to create a Pixabay account, which they can do with a Google account, and then go in and set strict filtering. So that's not a really great solution. And that's low percentage there, I think. We yeah, that. yeah, that's not really a great, well, you know, you could also, you know, fingers crossed that your, your school network blocks it, but that's not a really great option either. Um, so there are some other choices out there that are great. Uh, Unsplash, if you're looking for, so Pixabay I've always liked because it has photos as well as illustrations. Unsplash is great if you're looking for just photographs, just pure photographs. Unsplash is a good option as well. Um, and Rustin, you had a you had one that you liked as well. Yep, just toss the link in the chat as well. Photosforclass.com, an interesting interesting uh, tool. Uh, what it does is it it'll get you photos that that have been that have been screened uh, and. And I believe that that's also the tool where when you download the picture, you can you can download it with the site with the extended remix version of the citation attached like to the image. So right. so it's part of the, the image as you go. Yeah. So a pretty, pretty good one there. Yeah. I'll also say, you know, depending on the type of. Depending on the topic, I, I guess you're, you're, you're trying to address with your pictures. Uh, Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Commons are. Absolutely good places to find uh, images that are in the public domain or a Creative Commons license. Uh, you know, particularly anything that's a historical topic, good places to go and find representative images are, are Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Commons. Absolutely. So we got, let's see, I think we can probably get another question or two in. Judith added one to the chat. Does anyone have any good resources to help high school students focus? I'm finding <laughs> that the attention span needs a little help. Yeah, I do. Imagine. Uh, I've got a Chrome extension that I like called Stay Focused. Uh, and what it does is it will let you set a limit for how much time you can spend on time-wasting websites. <laughs> so you can, you can specify uh, that you're only going to be allowed, you're only going to allow yourself 15 minutes a day on Facebook or 10 minutes a day on Twitter or what, whatever website it is. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a social media site. It could be, you know, any site that you find yourself wasting time on. You can set a time limit for it. It will even show you a countdown timer when you go on that site. It'll show you a countdown timer and say, you have 11 minutes left of wasting your life on Facebook, right? It doesn't say wasting your life, but uh, <laughs> you know, it does say wasting your time on Facebook uh, or whatever website you're, you're on at the moment. So that one's a, a good one. Uh, I also, this is not a tool, uh, it's a strategy. Uh, the Pomodoro timer strategy, uh, where you set up blocks of time to accomplish things, mm -hmm. and then the timer just keeps running. Uh, so here's one. I'll, I'll, there's a bunch of them on the, on the web, but I'll put it in there right now. Uh, Pomofocus.io. You can set up a sequence of timers to try to get some tasks done. And, and I find, and I use, I use this method myself when I'm trying to write big chunks of work. Uh, like, okay, I've got 10 minutes that I'm gonna write uninterrupted. And then I'm gonna take a three minute break and then I'm gonna write 10 more minutes uninterrupted. Like that works a lot better than just saying, don't look at Facebook or, you know, what? I think anything that says, don't do this, isn't as effective as do this for 10 minutes, then you get whatever. Does that make sense? It does, it does. The, the, um, the, the thing to know, of course, is that as much as there might be tools that can help someone stay focused, probably the best tool you've got is, uh, is your, your planning, your, your, your approach to teaching, right? And so, you know, from one class to the next, one group might be able to handle eight to 10 minutes of, of lecture just fine, the next one, Two minutes is pushing it, uh, and so you have you have to just kind of strategize. Like, what 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 is what is the the more active approach to doing this? You know, how how can I how can I get kids talking about these things? If they can't stay on task with that, then you know what what's causing that? Can somebody else kind of help me with those ideas? So often, if if you're if you're humble enough about your teaching, 
recognizing that every class comes with its own kind of uh, style to it. Uh, you can you can become a, a much better teacher much faster by uh, by by embracing different kinds of possibilities and just seeing how they work and not taking it too personally if they don't. Richard, one more question. Do it. Last one. Last one we've got here. Uh, this one came from Christine, who sent me a picture of it. It's kind of hard to explain, but basically, uh, I have an issue that just started. My students are unable to insert videos into Google Slides. They get this error message, and the error message is that the video doesn't exist. The owner may have removed it. A lot of people have sent me this question in the last few weeks because Google did make a change to Google Workspace for Education default settings. And that change is that everyone was marked as being under 18 unless your domain administrator changed it. Uh, so so if, if your domain administrator had a teacher group and a student group, your teachers were fine, they were unaffected, but your students were affected because they were labeled as under 18. And the default setting is now that they don't have access to YouTube settings the way that they did before. So the solution comes back to your G Suite domain administrator, or Google Workspace domain administrator, who needs to enable the access for your students. Fair That's enough. Right. I will. I will second that uh, that that set of thoughts as we make our way into the home stretch of our little, our little show. Every week, uh, that'd be every month, I put together a newsletter. <laughs> and um, and it, this one mentions the September one, but by the time I send you the email that says, hey, here are the links and here are the slides, it's gonna say October, because there's an October one out there. Very happy about that as well. Uh, so we will, we will get that out. And there's always a way to earn a Starbucks card because why not? Additionally, I've written some books. If these are of interest to you and you want to kind of talk about you know, some of the ideas in them, just let me know. Happy to do so. This is a pretty cool book, uh, Electronic Shindig that it is. Richard, talk to us. Yeah, the Practical Ed Tech Handbook has 75 pages of my favorite ed tech tools, tips, tricks, strategies. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the section on search strategies and the section on accessibility settings. But you can take a look at all of it. It's free. Just go to practicaledtech.com slash weekly newsletter, and I'll email it to you like almost instantly. Uh, or just check out practicaledtech.com and click on the free handbook link, and you can get a copy of it. You can go to my YouTube channel as well if you decide that watching me live and watching my videos is fun. I've got uh, videos on all kinds of fun stuff, like how to manage Google Slides add-ons. And I would say that if you are curious about any of the kind of stuff that we talk about, we got a whole archives of these shows. We've, we've done almost 40 of these over time. And, and so if, you, if you're just looking for something a little bit different to binge, <laughs> which, which could be the case. Maybe you lost a bet and you're like, I have to like binge watch those two guys. <laughs> could be worse. Could be worse. Um, and you are welcome to send us your questions as well. Uh, we, we didn't get to at least one that was in the chat today. We'll, we'll maybe take that up a little bit after we finish the recording. But uh, for all of you who have joined us, thank you very much for spending your time with us. We hope that we have given you some insights on some tools that might be useful to you, some stories that might be helpful for prompting great discussions. And just some insights on what it is we do as teachers that might make it all the more fun for how you think of the work that you do. So with that, we will see you at our next shindig, our next show. I've used that word shindig multiple times over the course of it. Our next show, which is going to be three weeks from today, October the 28th. Take care. We'll see you then.